welcome back to the original Gangsters podcast. I'm Jimmy Bucciolato, and uh, here with my intrepid colleague, Scott Bernstein. Hey now, I haven't said that in a while. <laughs> right, and so I uh, don't want uh, you know people to have to adjust their TV sets or monitors. This isn't a rerun. This is a new episode. Um, I've been helping with some behind-the-scenes aspects of the show, but a lot of you know I, I, I rarely appear on camera any longer. Um, I did my recorded my last episode about I don't know two or three months ago, and some people were were asking me on social media what was up with that. I, I did post something on Instagram, but that was it. Uh, just thanking everyone. Uh, we did an episode a few months ago on the Lufthansa heist, and I, I if you go to the very end of it, I mentioned what was going on in my life. I need to to focus more on my um, academic stuff, teaching and writing at the university, so I just don't have the the time to commit to, uh, you know, full time on the podcast any longer. So anyhow, but once in a while, um, if I can, I'm happy to jump on again. And especially like an episode like this, we're, we're very honored to have a, a special guest. Um, Mooch, it's one of our, our uh, highest, you know, rated episodes. So we're happy to have uh, Mooch back and talk about his book. Welcome, my friend. Yeah, thanks so much for having me back, man. The last time was a really good time. So I'm happy to be back. It was tell, uh, Jimmy, tell everyone that might not know who Mooch is. Because uh, I'm yeah. sure we've we've gained a lot of followers uh, since Mooch was was on last time. Yeah, yeah, we have. Uh, it's it's uh, check out the episode with him before. It's very popular. But um, Mooch was part of the Outlaw uh, Motorcycle Club uh, subculture, and specifically the the Mongols and the Vagos, and, and he talked about his life. And um, but we're we're happy to have him back again because in the meantime he's published a book, The Ride of My Life. I highly recommend this this book. Um, I, I've gone through it a couple of times, and uh, there's, there's a lot of interesting stuff in here, stuff that wasn't covered in our podcast. So, um, um, you know, we're, we're happy to have you back, Mooch. Thanks so much for having me. And let everyone know also before we jump in, I mean, Mooch was a boss. He was a shot caller. Uh, he was one of the highest ranking Mongols um, in the country and, and helped uh, – was one of the original guys that kind of started to push the brand uh, out to the Midwest. It, it didn't really get that much publicity. Um, in in more recent years, there started to be a little bit more uh, attention put on that from both myself and Gangster Report, but also uh, mainstream media in Chicago. So Mooch, is, he's seen a lot, and, I'm, and we're just jacked and amped that he's come by uh, again to, to share his insight and his life with us. Yeah, and I, I wanted to um, go, go to the beginning, Mooch, because, you know, I thought I, I have had, uh, you know, some direct messaging with, with Mooch. I thought I was a troublemaker when I was in high school and then I ran with some with some tough dudes. <laughs> but you read this, you read this book and Mooch, you want to talk about Hellraisers. Uh, they made uh, me seem like, uh, you know, a, a, a Cub Scout. <laughs> so, yeah, my, um, poor mom, my poor mom had to deal with some stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the, just share a couple of stories maybe about just so the audience, I mean, you know, they can read the rest of it in the book, but just uh, just give the audience an idea of what we mean by that. Well, you know, I grew up in a, with an identical twin brother, so I think we were kind of in the search for identity, and for whatever reason, we decided that violence was going to be that identity. So um, we grew up wrestling and boxing and stuff, but it really turned into, you know, a lot of street fighting stuff, um, and we got heavy into the punk rock and anti-racist skinhead scene, so we spent a lot of time physically fighting with neo-Nazi skinheads, rival gangs, um, that type of thing. So, you know, a lot of going to concerts, getting in big group fights, um, you know, that back and forth of, of gang fighting and stuff like that. Yeah. And I want to ask you about that because you point out something in your book a couple of times that you grew up in a, your words, tight knit Italian family seems pretty stable, middle class. I mean, I, I know your biological father had some, some issues, but, um, but it seems like for the most part, you were tight with your grandparents, your mom. And, um, I think that's interesting because sometimes in the literature you'll you'll read that like this sort of economic reductionist um, argument that the only reason why people become involved in in youth gangs is because they have um, you know there's not a lot of economic development in the in the neighborhood and, and I th I do think that, that 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 can be a factor but in your case that that wasn't it so can you talk I mean what what was going on with socialization and psychology that would you know kind of instigate your brother you guys to have that kind of behavior even though it's not the usual suspects in terms of your your larger environment 
Well, and like you said, too, I think ecology plays a big part in that, right? If you're in a low income area, single parent household, stuff like that, then the statistics are going to speak a lot higher to what you're talking about, where, you know, they're looking for protection or belonging. Um, in my case, middle class, great family, um, you know, like I said, played sports and all that stuff. And, and for me, it was more of an identity piece. You know, as an identical twin, I was trying to figure out my place in the world, who I wanted to be known as. Um, and I found out pretty quick that I got a reputation, you know, negatively, unfortunately, um, from, you know, fighting and stuff. And then that drew me into just that punk rock and, and music scene. And I don't think people from the outside know how much gang involvement there is in that punk rock world or that or that, you know, hardcore music and punk rock. Um, and so I guess kind of learned as I went there and then really got sucked into that, that lifestyle. But it initially started more with just kind of the music and, you know, just getting into that that lifestyle. Do, do you think that's in some ways, like the the next step from the first step being in the late 60s, early 70s with Hell's Angels and maybe outlaws that were immersed in that kind of counterculture rock and roll. And then the, the, the that same group of people 10 years later or 15 years later or 20 years later were more drawn to the punk punk world. Yeah, I think there's a lot of hardcore metal, you know, that kind of for stuff. sure. Yeah, I think there's a lot of parallels between those two worlds, right? Like, it's me and my brother, we're in this together, we're family, you know, the, that type of thing, um, where, you know, we're going out actively in groups together to socialize events, whether it's a bike show or a concert, but we know what we're doing, we're going there together. Um, normally, I mean, depending on where you're from or the era, but it was more my neighborhood versus the other neighborhood or my city versus your city. So there was that whole bonding piece and, and essentially, for lack of a better term, almost trauma bonding piece because of the violence and the stuff that came with it. And I think there's a big overlap between that and motorcycle clubs for sure. Um, so by the time you're um, a little bit older, you're you're in a punk rock group yourself or a hardcore group and you start touring and, and you start interacting with some other crews. Um, across the country, and in some cases, it, it doesn't it doesn't go well. And there, there's some pretty compelling stuff in your book about interacting with the DMS crew. And th these are some dudes that were part of the hardcore scene on the East Coast. And they're, they're if you know about this kind of music, like there's they have a reputation for being some pretty tough motherfuckers. And um, can you tell us what like what for people that are unfamiliar with the subculture, what does that mean, DMS? And can, can you talk to us about that um, environment? Yeah. So, you know, each region in the in the country, if, if not city, but each region kind of had their own crew back in the day, you know, and DMS initially was the Doc Martin skinheads. And then they've changed it a bunch of times since there. Um, but they were some of the original, you know, that OG New York, New York City hardcore where Boston had FSU, um, which, you know, initially was fuck shit up and then Friends Stand United. Um, so there was these different clicks or crews around the country, you know, um, OBHC in, in Oakland and, you know, Unity and, and those guys in LA. And, and then we were in Portland, which was the Rose City Bobber Boys. So we all kind of had our own little niche um, and all the crews were kind of known for different types of things. Um, but DMS was that like initial from the hardcore scene, like, you know, they were involved in some of those really early initial bands that, you know, kind of had a huge influence in that hardcore scene. So because they were in popular bands, their name spread pretty quickly. So if, if you like, in some ways, you might think that there's solidarity within this this kind of subculture, because I think one thing that does unite them is is generally they're anti-racist. Um, but things are more complicated. right? Sometimes things can happen. And then um, there's politics. And I don't mean like ideological politics. I mean, like the different crews. And so at one point, you, you, you and your group had a falling out with the DMS. Is that correct? Is yeah. That correct? And, you know, egos play a big role in that. And I think that's something we see replicated in the biker world, too. Right. When we start talking about territory and stuff like that. Um, and, and, and ego plays a big role. And essentially, you know, I, I, I was in a band and I was touring and, you know, I was a younger kid. So I actually really was looking up to the DMS guys. Those bands were bands I was really, you know, super into. I was a big fan of. Um, but, you know, as you, as you grow and you age and you start earning your own reputation, you know, the, a, a, a gang's name can only go so far. And we had a, we had a falling out and they were making a lot of threats towards me and my crew. And, you know, that might have it might have it might have made a point if I was going to be in New York, but they were making these threats. And then they thought they were going to come into my area, which was a town that, you know, I grew up in, which were my people in my hometown. Um, and that's when things kind of 
kind of turned into the falling out. Yeah, I encourage people to check out the book again. Um, you could read more about that. Um, back to the, the hardcore. So like, I, I mean, when I think of like DMS, I think of like Agnostic Front and, and some of those New York hardcore bands that, that I was a fan of. And you said growing up, you were one of the reasons why you were attracted to this music was I think it was maybe your aunt or someone like that exposed you to some of the real OG punk rock. And you mentioned specifically the Clash and the Sex Pistols. And Scott and I like to talk about music a lot. We're big music fans. Uh, can you name any of the other uh, bands that that you were into as you know during this time period? You know, one of the very first bands she would play for me, she'd wake me up to One Step Beyond by Madness in the morning. That'd be like our morning oh, yeah. jam, you know? Um, and then I super, you know, the clash, I liked the clash probably more than the sex pistols, or I do like the clash more than the sex pistols. She was a big Ramones fan. So I got a lot of into that. So I, I was really getting into, you know, the damned, a lot of those early bands, um, bef- you know, when no one else in my circle or, you know, young kids, we didn't know what that stuff was. And I think, you know, when, when it started, it was kind of in that era where it was starting to get repopular again with bands like Rancid that were like covering the clash sound essentially, um, and that's what really started drawing me in is, you know, I was like, hey, this reminds me of the bands that my aunt would play for me. These are these cool old punk bands, but it was also more new and relevant. So I, I you know, that started getting into Rancid and Bouncing Souls and that kind of whole era of stuff. Um, and then, you know, once you're in it, man, I, you know, I was, it was, I was deep in it by then listening to, you know, I'm from Portland. So the big bands, Poison Idea and Defiance were all huge, you know, um, around that era, we were starting to get into the Unseen and, and Global Threat and the guys from Boston. So there, you know, depending on the on the city you were in, there was all these kind of like new resurgence of, of street punk. Yeah, so I know we're geeking out here, but the Clash, uh, the Guns of Brixton, and uh, Charlie Don't Surf, my two favorite songs. You know those ones. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and there's some some crossover to that and different <laughs> once again yeah. the world too. But yes, no, that's right. And the Guns of Brixton, I mean, that's a that's a that's gangsta. When you read the lyrics to that, the Clash, they were like white working class dudes, and they you know talking about battling with the cops. And Absolutely, shit like that. the Clash were one of those early like really political bands, really that you know was kind of masked in punk rock, and and because they're a little more mainstream, I think they kind of got away with it, but it was still very focused on politics and you know that kind of anti establishment working class ethos yeah so eventually um you know you you transition into uh, the um things are getting pretty pretty hot with the hardcore scene and there's some other things going on in, in your life that you, you decide to, to to make a move but you, you're still a, a tough guy uh, uh you know a hellraiser so um you start to be I'm interested in, in the outlaw biker club scene because you know you're a motorcycle enthusiast you already have this reputation as a tough guy uh, from the punk rock and hardcore scenes um what what first was like your your inclination to that, that maybe try the outlaw um biker scene rather than the hardcore scene you know, Portland was a little different because the clubs there were very old school. You know, the dominant club there is the Gypsy Jokers. And so that kind of era that was still kind of the beer belly, leather clad biker, right? And and so, you know, it, it wasn't something I initially looked at and said, oh, I want to be a part of that. It wasn't until I met, the, I mean, there were some clubs in town I'd met and, like, and we talked about, I think in the last podcast, a little bit about the outsiders and kind of learning those old school politics. But you know, I've said it before is, you know, I'm looking around this room of these old school bikers and I'm thinking, I don't have a lot in common with these guys other than the motorcycle itself. Um, What really sucked me in is when I met the Vagos. The Vagos had a lot of younger guys, a lot of skateboarders, punk rockers. In fact, uh, the band Seven Seconds, man, their guitar player, Bobby, I I ended up bringing him into the Vagos. He was an active Vago for a long time. So we had a lot of this overlap of like guys that came from that punk rock scene. And so once I kind of found out, found that, you know, it's really kind of like, seemed like, oh, this is the connection. This seems the way it's supposed to be because, you know, some of those DMS guys went into the Angels. A lot of FSU went into the Outlaws. It was kind of like that regional, you're from the hardcore punk rock scene. You were going to go to whatever club, big club was in your area. Yeah, um, it, it's interesting um, that to, to read about that transition too because I, I, I want to talk to you about, ask you about like like stereotypes of bikers because, again, most of these dudes from, from the hardcore scene – usually anti-racist, uh, you know, politically charged. And there is this kind of image, I think, of of, of at least one, some one percenter clubs, maybe not the Mongols, but some of the, the other OG clubs, that these are like exclusive white, if not, you know, white supremacist um, viewpoint. So your your autobiography and your experiences really challenge that. Not to say that that 
doesn't exist in some elements of, of that world. But your autobiography really challenges that. Can you talk about that? Yeah, I mean, it was still, you know, a pretty big paradigm shift for me to go from hey, the side of SS bolts and swastikas were fighting to being in a club where that shock value and that stuff was so inherent and so deep in biker culture. Um, and, and you know, for you guys know this because you study biker culture and stuff, you know, a lot of that his history is in the shock value and the anti-establishment kind of the pushback. But there's also, you know, a heavy recruitment of people that just like from my life came from the hardcore scene that came, there's a group, you know, large groups that came from the neo-Nazi scene and they brought those images with them too. I think one of the big shifts is, especially the angels after the seventies and eighties is they got this real big push from the influence of prison gangs. And I think then we saw that start playing a role. So it kind of depended which club you were in or, or who you were around um, about that type of stuff. You know, I think the imagery is still really popular in that, in that club life. I mean, it's gotten less, but it's still, but as far as the actual ideologies are quite a bit different, you know I mean? I can speak on half of, the Mongols, because we're, you know, pretty much a Hispanic and white club. Um, but, you know, some a lot of clubs have different rules when it comes to that stuff. But as far as like overt racism or stuff you would think of because of those symbols, it wasn't like that. I mean, even the, the I'm not justifying it at all, but even the Sex Pistols, we were talking about old school punk rock, you know, they were infamous for, they would they would have used the swastika sometimes. As, um, and obviously, I, I think that was in poor taste and that was a, a bad decision. But they, they weren't ideologically inclined toward that. They, it was, to your point of shock value, they were trying to piss people off. It was I, I think the counterculture. Yeah, that was that, the, but, idea. It was the, the counterculture aspect of it. Of We don't want right. you to like us anyways. You know, that was, that's right. kind of the, uh, the right. mindset behind it. Right, right. So, um, um, but speaking of like the, the subculture and, you know, what, for, for those of us who are outsiders trying to understand the subculture, you give a definition of, of one percenter clubs in, in your book that I think is interesting. Um, because, and, and you can, people can go back and listen to another episode where, where Mooch gets into the more of the details about his experience with the Vagos and things like that. So I, I'm, you know, I'm trying to, to, to bring up other, other things here in the book. Um, but there, there's a standard definition for one percenters within law enforcement, and that's that one percenter clubs are basically organized crime groups. Um, but that's not your definition. Can you can you talk about share that with us based on your experiences? Yeah, and I know you know this is one of those things where probably everyone in that world has a different idea on what it means. I think to me to boil it down in the simplest in this day and age is the one percenter club is the dominant club in that area. That's that's the club that's controlling that state or the, or the region. Those are, that's the club that the other clubs are, you know, needing to, that is running the COC or needing permission. So for me, the one percenter club, those like the top tier clubs that are in charge of those regions. Now, you know, as far as where that term came from and what law enforcement says, I understand all that, but you know, in the grand scheme of things, all that patch means at this point is kind of who's in control of that area. Let me, can I, can I ask you a question on how that how do you reconcile that particular uh, definition with what we have here in Detroit? Because it's it's kind of unique where the outlaws are the name brand and they're the they're the kind of like um, international corporate um, like the logo or product. whatever. Yeah. yeah. So they have a big presence and Taco Bowman being from Detroit and moving the seat of power from Illinois to Detroit from the early 80s to about 2000. So Detroit's known as an outlaw town nationally. But locally, the Highwaymen, which is a much smaller group overall, has considerable more um, uh, uh, membership in Michigan as a whole than the outlaws do. They don't like each other. They've never really been at war with each other per se, I don't think. Uh, but I've always kind of, when people ask me about biker culture in Detroit, I always feel like I got to explain it. Um, it's It doesn't necessarily fit like other cities might. Do you agree with that? Yeah, for sure. And, and dominance kind of uh, probably for lack of better term, really. So, you know, the outlaws, dominant as far as the region might, is likely run by them and they're yeah, the yeah. bigger national club but a lot of there's still a lot of old school clubs have been for around a long time like i mentioned the gypsy jokers that 
are in control of that area. And when I say in control, you know, we're not talking organized, organized crime. I'm not talking about that type of control. I just mean when other clubs want to start, that's who they ask permission from. Those are kind of the clubs that are organizing all the other motorcycle clubs. So, you know, in a, a club like the Highwaymen, and they've been there for so long. And they're, they're, still, a, they're a Detroit club. They were founded in Detroit. Exactly. So they would still technically be the dominant Detroit club, just they might not be nationally dominant. Um, so there's kind of different layers to it, you know, and, and that's with the biker stuff. It gets a little more challenging because, like you said, it's almost like there's the big name brands and then there's the old school ones that have been there forever that don't have a lot of numbers, but they they're well respected and they're not going anywhere. And then in Detroit, you also have it split down between east and west where high women founded on the west side, west side club doesn't really have much or any of a presence on the east side the outlaws dominate east side but do have a small presence on the west side so it's i know i'm, I'm going down on my own little rabbit hole here about you know where we come from but right well uh, and it's tough to say without more information but i will say from my experience a lot of what i've seen there spent in the i've seen the outlaws do it a lot is a lot of those times when those clubs end up being in the same area they, whether they end up having beef or not, they decide that, hey, both clubs are going to stay. They likely drop some sort of contract or, or have some sort of agreement. And it, it's highly likely that they agree to sticking to one. You get this side of town, I get that side of town. Or you guys go to these bars and we'll go to these bars. Yeah. And that's pretty common when it comes to coexistence because, um, you know, that's going li to limit the stepping on toes and the ego that goes with it. And, and Benny, you can hit the siren here. Um, but just for like an anecdote that, that I think piggybacks off what Mooch has said, I might have told this on the show before, but maybe not. I'll, I'll throw it out here now and, and do my normal uh, name dropping self. Be my normal name dropping self. Name dropping self. But uh, I went to Frank the Bomb, uh, his funeral. I don't. It was five six years ago, and uh, Frank the Bomb was the Detroit mobster that was the conduit to the biker world, and he could go into any biker clubhouse in Detroit and they roll off the red carpet for him. And his birthday parties used to be the only place that all those guys could be in the same room and, you know, cables weren't flying. And uh, I remember pulling up to the, to the uh, funeral home and there were like four different groups. It was like vigilantes, outlaws, highwaymen, and maybe it was uh, iron coffins or renegades. I don't remember, but they all like had different parts of the funeral home property. Like they like it was like broken out into like four different regions yeah. of the funeral. <laughs> and you're getting to see play out what happens nationally or, yeah. or statewide. You're getting to see it in a small area, but that's exact yeah. representation is essentially stick to your side of the sandbox. Yeah. yeah I want to ask you about that. Another conceptual question here. One, one of the, I think it's on page 61. It, it's really like a, a major thesis in, in your chapter that territory is extremely important. And I want to ask that because, again, from what you would hear from law enforcement, they would say, well, yes, it's important because they want to control drug turf or extortion or gambling or whatever it is. Um, you, you obviously are you know, push back against that narrative. So why? I mean, help us understand, like, why? Why is that important? Like, why can't the Hells Angels and the and the, and the outlaws just, you know, you know, ride in the same city and, and coexist? Why? What's going on there with this kind of like tribal politics? And I, Well, I think you hit it on the, the nail on the head when you had the tribal piece to it. I think like we were just talking about with the highwaymen, who's been there the longest. I think, you know, ego plays a, a huge role in this. Um, hey, we were here first. Hey, that's our bar. Um, that type of thing. And, you know, there's so much pushback. The smaller club that's well, rep, well it's been there forever with a big reputation has to fight back against the well-known corporate club, essentially. Um, so I think that plays a way bigger piece than any sort of illegal organized crime crime stuff at this day and age. I mean, I wasn't around long enough to ever say that, you know, that back then maybe it used to be over drug money or whatever. I, I mean, I doubt it, but that wasn't my era. But I know in my era, that's definitely was never the issue. It's It's ego. It's always been ego. Um, for instance, if you look at Chicago, you know, outlaws, this is our area. No one else is going to come in here. And and then it happened with the angels. And I think what history's proven, though, and I think maybe this is why more and more clubs are expanding all over the country, is I think history's proven at this point that every club's going everywhere. Um, you know, 
if it used to be a handshake or, or whatever, or there's agreements and they wouldn't go, you know, those are still respected in some areas. But overall, say say that the angels push in somewhere and the outlaws tell them not to, and then the Mongols do, or maybe then the pagans do, or the bandit, someone else is going to do it, you know? And so at this point, I think it's almost like people are in, a, the, all these bigger clubs are almost in a rush to get there because I think those fences have kind of come down. Yeah, there, there's some really it, it's some interesting insight into your book, and you and tell me if I if I have this correct, because it can go it can cut both ways. So I I noticed there's some there's some areas in your book where you say that actually the rank and file like you were getting along with rank and file outlaws and banditos, and then a, a, a judgment can come from above a political judgment then that now puts you in an awkward position because the the presidents aren't getting along. And, and and then that trickles down. But then I also noticed like it can cut the other way where there's some beef between the rank and file. But then the president tells everyone, I don't care. We're going to we're, we, we have to keep it cool with this other club. And then there's some frustration. So it can, can cut either way. Can you can you comment on those situations? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, that, that's when we get into the politics of things, right? And and I guess that's the point of having an organized structure in a club. Every club's structured a little different. I know the Mongols, it's a top-down leadership. So if the national P, whoever it is at the time, says, hey, hands off, better not get caught putting hands on any of those clubs or, or you know, there's going to be repercussions. Um, you know, and if it's something local and, and feelings are hurt or, or maybe it's an ego battle and it's a minor skirmish, then that might get squashed. But a lot of times it goes to the table and, and they discuss pros and cons. And for the most part, coexistence is best for everybody, right? I mean, there's at the end of the day. Now, I, I wish that's really how it played out, but that would be the idea. But yeah, and then there's positions like, I mean, you know, mine is my example, since we're talking about kind of the story of my book is I had an amazing relationship with the outlaws my whole time in the club. I did the majority of the sit downs with those guys. A lot of them came from FSU, like I said. So we had shared history from all that scene and, and it's some very, very close friends and one of the things I told them when I moved to Illinois is that I had no interest in ever starting a Chicago chapter. Um, now I never shot myself in the foot and said I wouldn't, but I said I have no interest in it. And I gave my word to numerous people that I respect that I would never, you know, I would no interest in starting a chapter. And then at one point national leadership said, Hey, Mooch, we're starting a chapter in Chicago. Um, what do you do? You're, you know, when, when there's a leadership structure like that, um, you know, I voiced my opinion. I, you know, my, I voted a different way, voiced my opinion, but when the call was made, well, you're in this club, you got to back your club's decision, your club's calls, and now we're burning bridges and, you know, people are upset. So it, it definitely, um, I mean, you've, anytime you're in something like that, a club, gang, whatever, you got to think, well, what's the greatest good or, or the greater good? And you have to follow the structure and the leadership. Yeah, you 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 really were put in these uh, awkward situations. And also, you know, not only in Illinois, but but I know I noticed in, um, in Oregon, there was an issue with a, a smaller club where you assured them that the Mongols weren't going to um, start up a chapter near them. Um, I can't remember the name of the uh, Portland. Club. We weren't going to wear the Portland rocker out of respect yeah. for their speed and the outsiders. Right. Um, and I had made an agreement and we all shook hands. We were allowed to have a chapter in the area. We just wasn't, we weren't going to call it Portland. Right. But okay. I right. moved out of the state and someone else became in charge of that state and decided that my agreement they didn't agree with and they went back on it. Um, and that's kind of the frustration in the biker world is, and I'm, you guys have seen it. You guys have been following this stuff for a long time. When, how often leadership rolls over, then you want to go, well, how long are these agreements going to be for? Because my agreement was a handshake deal between friends versus this new guy might say, well, I don't care. I don't see the interest in it. You look at yeah, with, uh, I, the pagans. Sorry, right? God, sorry, oh, God, sorry God. Jimmy. No, just saying, look at Ray, uh, uh, Conan, in, um, Conan Richter, Keith Richter, the pagans boss, the one who's making all the waves, no pun intended, uh, these last five years. You know, he took power and what's, you know, I've heard that uh, the term that both law enforcement and guys in the club said to me, like a bloodless coup. Where like he didn't kill the guy that preceded him, but the guy didn't leave voluntarily. Uh, Trone, Michael Trone, who uh, uh, was basically pushed out in 2017 and Conan takes over and like the entire operation the entire organization then begins being molded in richter's image and it goes from a club that's totally fine with having pennsylvania virginia west virginia maryland and part of new york and 
six years, six, seven years later, they're like, we want the whole country. Because it wasn't, wasn't much different than when Doc Cavasso started doing the same thing, you know, which, um, you know, that's what brought me into the club is because he was on the, I, I came from the Vagos, which traditionally I wouldn't have been allowed to patch over. And, and I will say, I don't know if we talked about it before at the time, but the Vagos weren't considered one percenter club at the time I was in and they weren't as big as they are now. Um, so it's somewhat common to take that, you know, with that, no disrespect, but that step up you know, what would happen. But now that they're more of a parallel club, that wouldn't have happened. But because of the Doc Cavazos recruitment drive, not much different than Conan's, you know, guys like I, like guys like Remy, me would be able to come in and start in a new area. And, you know, I started in Oregon where there was no other Mongols in the entire state. Um, there was an agreement there with the Jokers that no other major 1% club was going to be in that state. Um, and guys like us came in and, and challenged those old agreements. Um which, you know, I mean, sorry, it is what it is, but that's what happened. And um, and I think that really starts, you know, people start seeing that, that, oh, this club did it or that club did it. And then more and more clubs start pushing through. I think, you know, I can't speak on behalf of a lot of other clubs because everyone's run different. But, you know, the Mongols are still very democratic and voted. So before you move into an area, the club's still going to vote on it as a whole. But if you get in those areas uh, where, you're, like you said, that with Conan or whatever else and a, and a P says, here we are. Well, that's where you're going to be. Jimmy, it's interesting looking at, again, making it kind of a little bit more local for us. The Outlaws have been the, you know, the dominant Midwestern club, you know, for time of Memorial. Um, they went down and, and took over a lot of Florida, which is less the case now because of some other things that I've written about. But you've never seen the Outlaws in the 50, 60 years of their existence, or at least this versions existence i know that the outlaws like to say that they were founded in the 30s uh but you've never seen the outlaws try to push into southwest or west or pacific northwest am i am i right uh, for the most part yes and and from again that's just from what i've seen you know over the years is they are pretty strict about how they start new chapters and they won't jump a chap they won't start a state somewhere where they don't have so they're slowly going to move so they they have been pushing west from what I've seen, you know, they're getting bigger. They're Oklahoma area. They were into Colorado. Um, so they have pushed West, but they kind of do it chapter by time so that they're not just jumping into a brand new state or being fresh like some of those other clubs are doing. So Oklahoma, So as I'm thinking about it now, it's, it's, it's kind of playing in my head. I know they started the Oklahoma chapter in 77. So that was pretty West for, for that group in 77. Yeah. And then, you know, they got into Colorado, which um, I think they I don't know if they still have chapters there or not, but I know they did. Um, and then I, I'm honestly, I'm a little out of the loop on where they're at now, but I know, you know, I had heard they'd pushed into Northern Texas. I don't know if that's true or not, but you know, I, oh, I, I know, I know that they have an arrangement with the Banditos down in Texas. Yes, I'm we've, not all, sure. yeah, we've all heard the agreements. I just don't know if it's for sure there or not. I just so, heard, they, so they're expanding as well. I've just heard from guys that are some of my sources that have told me that they can, for a while, some of these guys were going down there for jobs, like they had nothing to do with. Yeah, and that's really common. Motorcycle stuff. And they would be like, when we would go down there, we could never wear our outlaw gear. And they're like, at some point in the last year or two, they're like, we can go down there and wear it now. Yeah, and that, that's pretty common. Every state has kind of different rules depending on who's there and then depending on the relationships between those clubs there too. You know, if those two clubs are being cool at the time, then it's probably not a problem. And if they're not, it's not going to happen. So it kind of, you know, those things are in flux. Another thing I wanted to ask uh, Mooch about, which is which is in, in your book a lot here again, uh, please check it out, everyone, The, the Ride of My Life. Um, as you get, so you, you 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 go from the Vagos to the Mongols, you can, people can listen to our other episode and, and find out more about that, but it seems like when you're in the Mongols, man, like every every corner, it's like, you you know, you're in California, you're, you're in Nevada, and you're, you're hanging with different, different, you know, chapters. And it seems like every corner there's a there's a an informant that, that you're running into that you obviously you don't know at the time. In some cases, like high ranking dudes who are like you know informants. I mean, I, I'm reading this and I'm like, fuck, man, like you can't even like you know you can't take two steps without bumping into an informant in this world. Can you can you talk about that? Yeah, I mean, a part of it was the time that I was coming around because it was Operation Black Rain. So they were, you know, there was ATF agents and there were as there were agents in there, they were turning people into informants. Um, so I think that was probably more common um, or for that area or for that time. But just like in Oregon, you know, I started in Oregon and, you know, anytime someone starts a new chapter, you were looking for new members. 
and law enforcement knows that and that's you know they'll start trying to get the informants in there and and we've seen um with some of these other big clubs we're talking about that have been growing and, and growth and then we see these raids and people get hit and it's like more and more common that this big confidential informants is a, a big part of law enforcement's pushback against motorcycle clubs and i think it's all too common um and but i said more and more of my piece it was because of black rain was a big part in that for sure because once black rain hit and you know indictments started getting handed down and then sentences started getting wrapped up a lot of those guys were no longer around or no longer members of the club but it was it's interesting to read in your in your book about because you were you you admit that you were um kind of green when it comes to like the the informant gang game so like so like dudes would would ask you like weird questions like uh just like is is anyone carrying you know like a piece and 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 wherever you were, I think it was Oregon, right? Like like you weren't allowed to have concealed weapons, and so you're kind of like, why the fuck is this guy asking me this this kind of shit? And so if you talk to us about like the, when you when you're like your radar starts to go on that, it's kind of a, it's almost kind of embarrassing looking back now that I didn't notice these red flags. But you know, I'm I'm in my mid twenties. I'm coming from the punk rock world. And you know what I knew of uh, of informants? I mean, I knew about undercover cops, right? I mean, I did, or I knew that that was what they would try and do. I was really, really naive to what a paid confidential informant was. And the two that were in the chapter that I was in initially, um, you know, I, I when I got into leadership, I I banned methamphetamine, and you couldn't sell drugs. And you know, the two informants were actually addicted to meth, and and we had taken them to rehab to get them clean to try and be good brothers for them. All the while, they're getting paid to tell like, to make stuff up. So I missed a lot of that because in my head, I'm like, well, this guy can't be working for the cops. He's doing the dope. Doing something stuff. illegal. Yeah. And and they were doing more illegal stuff than anyone in it. And what what's kind of crazy to think is they were actually even pushing a lot of the illegal stuff. When when we were in Oregon and, and the other clubs didn't want us there, it was some tense moments. And it was the informants that were out trying to get pick fights with these other clubs or, like I said, doing doing drugs. And, and the one of the ones you referenced that's in my book is they kept trying to talk us in, as a chapter into stealing motorcycles and then selling it the money for chap, you know, as the chapter, because I mean, we all know why they were trying to do that. Um, but you know, it, some of those things we would just, I mean, obviously we'd shut it down immediately because it was a red flag. And one of them was even ATF agent in black rain. And it, that's when he was asking about people carrying firearms or, you know, going with them in a, in a deal, he would say, and, you know, trying to offer people easy money. Um, and thankfully, you know, we said no to that stuff, but you know, what brought me in the motorcycle club world was my love for motorcycles. And then obviously, you know, I would tell people if I was ever going to get in anything, any trouble for anything, I'd be defending my brothers or my club. Cause you know, I was into violence then and I fought a lot, but there was no like big massive criminal conspiracy going on. And so when these guys couldn't see that they would try and make it. Yeah. Th there's a really interesting um, part in your book where you're, you're actually, you know, taking college classes I think this might have been the Black Rain investigation, but it, you could correct me if I'm wrong. I'm, my chronology might be off. I'd have to look back at my notes. But um, there's actually a narrative within federal law enforcement and within the media that Mooch is a, is a crime boss. But the, the reality is he's, he's literally, he had to move back in with his parents, if you don't mind me saying. No, I don't mind. Literally live, living in your parents' basement, right? Because you were, you were working odd jobs and didn't have a lot of cash. And so you were going to college. And so you're studying for exams, living in your parents' basement. And I just, I laugh because I'm, I'm, I'm not laughing that you had to go through that, but, but the irony, right? Like, like, boy, if you're a crime boss, that ain't very good, <laughs> not a very good crime boss. This is no, no bullshit. When Black Rain happened and all the mobs in Oregon got raided, you know, my brother was yelling, you know, what are you, what, what's the, what's on the warrant? What are you raiding us for? And they were trying to make it sound like we were some big drug kingpins. And my brother goes, why don't you open my fridge and see if you look like I'm living like, like a drug dealer, you know? Right, right. That's what I mean. Like you, you were, you guys were balling out, man. You were studying for exams and, and living in the basement. So um, I, it just kind of, I couldn't help but find it, um, you know, not that you had to go through that, but, you know, there, but there's other instances of, I would say abuse of police power. Uh, abuse of police power, where they, um, I really think, um, violated your civil liberties. And you can find out more about this in the book. But you're, you don't come off as jaded, though. And I, and I think it, it, it's interesting for you, for people to look at that because you're a matter of fact. But at the same time, um, you were able to move on with your life. And if you, you could just, I mean, 
walk us through that because I think you would have every right to be really fucking pissed off about about what they what they put you through. Well, and you know, again, you know, being a naive younger kid, obviously didn't trust law enforcement, but I also wanted to believe to some degree that they wouldn't just blatantly lie to you know what I mean. Um, but then I saw it firsthand in my trial, you know, that blatant lies. Um, I saw that, you know, once I gotten was, you know, not getting in trouble and I was going back to school and, and, you know, I was doing internships and they were still trying to get me fired for my internships. Um, I mean, and to me, it almost turned like I was, I was their rival gang member at this point, you know, they were showing up and trying to intimidate me, trying to get me thrown out of my jobs, told me I couldn't train at different gyms that we were training at. Um, so yeah, I think it could have made me pretty jaded. I think one of the things that helped that was a my career. I work in social work, and sometimes I do meet with probation officers that are actually you know that are caring, good people. Um, once I really got into martial arts, I met some law enforcement officers that are actually in law enforcement because they want to make a difference in their community. Um, but I think you know the, the caveat to that is these specialized police officers, the ones that are in the, you know outlaw motorcycle gang investigators unit and. You know, they, it's more like us versus them instead of, you know, what's just. Yeah. And they, and I think we talked about this the last time they, they, they get committed to a worldview or, or a paradigm that this is the way it is. And there's no amount of Intel that's going to get them to change or, or evidence that's going to get them to change their tunnel. Right. Vision. It's almost funny to think of because if they want to block by the narrative that every one percenter is because it's some criminal organization and they're out through this massive criminal stuff while wearing a patch and being under investigation. And then they're really not busting that many people doing that. So it, it, either they're all doing it, you're terrible at your job, or there's not that many people really doing it. But I mean, I know that's a very simple, simplified version of it. Um, but I mean, it's true. That's kind of, I mean, at least that's the way I look at it. And is in your text, you, you mentioned that Actually, the the feds blamed you for shutting down Black Rain, right? That yeah. you outed you outed the informant. Um, so it, actually, in the paperwork, they blame you for. I, I guess it's a blame uh, because they would have wanted to continue it. Can you can you talk about that? Yeah. So you know, I, I was in San Diego at the time. I was on the run from Oregon because I was on probation for those other charges, and and a, a part of my stipulation probation was that I couldn't affiliate with the Mongols. So I absconded and moved to San Diego, knowing they weren't going to extradite me on some misdemeanor warrants. Um, and Black Rain was was wrapping up. This was a full undercover ATF agent. And he was going around asking Mongols if if they would participate. He was going to be doing a drug deal and wanted armed people there to protect this drug deal. Now, what it turned out to be was an undercover agent selling fake drugs to another undercover agent. The whole thing was a show. But they were busting guys for carrying firearms and facilitation of a drug deal. And here's a guy I don't know. He pulls me aside one day. I met him when he was a hang around once. Um, and he said he was going to be up in Oregon visiting. And I said, oh, cool. You know what part? And he said, well, Eugene or Portland. Well, that's where we had a chapter. But there, those places are, you know, 100 miles apart. Um, so odd. First red flag. Didn't know where he was going to be at. And I was, you know, typical brotherhood stuff. Hey, anything you need, let me know when you're up there. And he goes, well, yeah, actually. You know, I could use some guys. You got guys that carry. And I said, you know what, man? No, we don't. And I started to walk off and he goes, man, I'm talking kilos, bro. He said he would give me $200 per member and he would pay me or whatever. I think it was 2000. It was a bunch of money. He goes, I can give it to you up front right now. And then you can pay them to stand there uh, to protect me in this drug deal. And so I obviously went and told leadership. Um, and by then they'd been hearing this because he actually had been doing it. So they'd heard about it by enough times. So then at a uh, hitman's funeral, it came up again. He had said something to my twin brother about it. And by then I, that was the vote was, you know what? We've been hearing this too many times. We're going to throw this dude out. And I'm sure somehow there within the amount of informants that are involved, he found out. So he didn't show up. He didn't, we didn't go from the funeral home to the burial site. And then two days later, the raids hit. And so I guess that they had to wrap it up earlier than they expected because finally, finally pulled the covers on them. Did you want to jump in Scott? It looked like you were. Good. No, I'm fat. I'm just, I'm like riveted by, Mooch's so, uh, so and we, story uh, in life. <laughs> yeah, we, and then, you know, there's a lot of paperwork on that. And then um, there's a book out. I think it was called Out Bad that I got that aging rebel guy used to. I don't know if you guys ever followed aging rebel. Stuff. Yeah, but he died. Didn't he die? He did. Yeah, but yeah, that, I was in that, contact with him a little bit at the end. That section's in the book where they, he pulls it straight out of the paperwork where it said that due to a Mongol named Mooch pulling Detective So and So's or Agent So and So's covers, they had to up the raids and. <laughs> get their arrest warrants and do their raids quicker. He was an outlaw. 
Who's that? Aging Rebel. I don't think he was. No, he wasn't. No, I don't. Maybe think I'm so. confusing him with somebody else. He he was just was old. He was just an old school motorcycle rider. Yeah, uh, covered all those kind of crime stories and, and wrote stuff. And he was he got real close to the Mongols at the end just because he was one of the ones covering all that Black Rain stuff. Maybe I don't. Yeah, know. I don't think I, he had an official affiliation with. Maybe I'm, I, I'm, I'm confl- I could be, con- I could be conflating. Um, I remember talking to him about a uh, outlaws president confirming with aging rebel that the outlaws president had died and maybe i'm just conflating that i was going to ask him about an outlaw that he confirmed for me he was pretty tied into the scene because you know he was he was he ran one of the first news sites on the website that was really trying to post the truth about what the government was doing against motorcycle clubs and he would do it based off paperwork it wasn't conspiracy theory some of some of his stuff got out there but most of it was all factual and it was like the one place to go to read what was really going on and and he instead of um, you know, saying, oh, this is happening to the outlaws or this happened to the Mongols, he would tie it together to show why it's happening to both these clubs. And so he played a pretty big role in kind of opening people's eyes to what the law enforcement narrative was. So, you know, you 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 relocate to Illinois and, and you talk about that in our other episode and it's in the book. You 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 had personal reasons, you know, in terms of uh, you know, your relationship and furthering your education. You you guys had your own reasons to go there. But you um you do you do um, continue to be a, a member of the Mongols there, and initially things are, are seem pretty copacetic with the outlaws, and um, you're getting along with them. And then again, back to like the politics comes up where there's there's a shift where now it seems like the the, the leadership there um, is against coexisting with the Mongols, and this is sort of like the the, the beginning of the end where um, there's some tensions there, and then there's some politics within your own club. Um, so, um, I know, I know you have another obligation, so we don't have a, a lot of time left, but can, can you talk to us a little bit? I mean, people can read the book, but a little bit about like the, the politics in Illinois with the outlaws and how, how things started to, to get tense. Well, yeah. And like we had started this, um, interview off, you know, that, that they started here, it was their area. Um, and so, and I, I was moving out here and essentially just to retire initially, it was in fact, put, picked a place where there wasn't Mongols at the time. Um. And, and I had given them my word that I wasn't out here to start chapters. Now, again, I didn't say I wasn't going to, but I my, was not my goal. That wasn't why I was here. Um, and, and they treated me amazing, man. I mean, they, t- I was invited to all their parties, their runs. We spent a lot of time together. We rode around together. Um, by then, I was already in national leadership. So I was doing a lot of sit downs with their national leadership. So, you know, they were vouching for me. And, and um, you know, I was just really getting to know all the local guys and spending a lot of time with them. And when we first started, the Mongols out here, a lot of the guys actually lived on the Illinois side of the border, but we called it St. Louis out of respect for them. Um, so we kind of were doing what we could to coexist. And then, you know, nationally, some politics had changed. Uh, the Chicago thing started, obviously, was a big push in that as well. And then things kind of started to get a little more dangerous and fall apart. Mooch, did you also have some guys that were like in uh, northwest Indiana? Yeah. So when I moved out here, there was one the Crawfordsville area chapter in Indiana. Um, and then Kansas city had a couple members left for people. That, I, go ahead. Just for people that don't understand, or I shouldn't say don't understand, but ha- that aren't from the Midwest, because I didn't know this until I lived in Chicago, Northwest Indiana, you know, it's similar to like Cherry Hill, New Jersey, where it's like uh, Cherry Hill is like a suburb of Philadelphia, even though it's in New Jersey, Northwest Indiana, you can be in Gary, Indiana, and get in your car and be in Chicago in like 15 minutes. And I think that's something that was missed or maybe, or like you said, most people don't know is out of respect. Again, there were several Mongols in Chicago for many, many years, but they were going, they were out of the, the Lake County, the Gary, Indiana right. chapter. Which is again, um, it's like a sub, it's almost like a suburb. It's, I know it's a different state, but when you leave Gary, Indiana, you're, you're not like in, some part of Illinois, you go from Gary, Indiana, right to the south side of Chicago. And I think, you know, I think there's that misconception about that. I remember reading some articles in the paper or some other podcasters had made some comments like, oh, these guys from California are moving into Chicago and they don't understand the local politics. But these are local guys. When when the Mongols expand, I mean, sure, I moved out here, but I didn't talk other people to move out here and start chapters with me. These guys that join, no matter what club it is, pagans or anyone, they're local guys. And these and in Chicago, there was Mongols there for several years, but they were running out of the Gary, Indiana chapter. 
But again, you know, ego and people are stepping on each other's toes. And I won't even say he's right and wrong in that aspect. I just know that's what happened and headbutt it started happening. And then nationally things started changing. And then, like you said, some internal Mongol politics, um, you know, things just kind of started to unravel. I would say that like that particular region, meaning Chicago and, and the outlaws is a, you know, probably they, they have more of a territorial obsession with that area than maybe any other club besides the angels in California, because the outlaws feel like this is where it all started for everybody. Right. And I would say to that narrative, because I agree, I agree. And I do see why people saw that as a direct slap in the face <laughs> and I won't even get in the politics of it, but I could get that. But I would also say, um, okay, Mongols and outlaws were friends at the time. We're supposed to be good friends and good neighbors. And everyone at the time was not friends with the hell's angels and they're here too. So why would you tell your enemies they can be there and not your friends? And I'll, we can leave it at that without getting too deep into it. But at least that was my mindset at the time. Do the, did yeah, the hell's well, angels have hell's angels chapters or were they support clubs? Chicago, no, they've had they've been in Chicago for a very long time since that old Rockford area around there. But with that whole, you know, after that, the what was the Hell's Henchman that patched over? Yeah, but they're actually ain't. I, I'm I'm showing that I'm I yeah, no, blind spots in my reporting, but I are Chicago Hell's Angels. They're yeah. actual Hell's Angels. In Chicago. Yeah, I mean there was there was some there was some bad shit that went down. But no, I know <laughs> yeah. about all. No, no, I know about all that. I've written about that. But yeah. I, I don't know why. And and I guess um, again, I'm conflating things in my head. I thought after all that, the Hells Angels were kind of like pushed out of yeah. Chicago and they might have had some support clubs. But you're saying there's Hells Angels chapters active in the city of Chicago. Yeah, they had a reputable chapter in there. They probably still do. If you follow like Mel Chancey and some of these big name guys that have gotten out, those are Chicago Hells Angels. Okay. Yeah, I've, I've talked to, I had a correspondence with Mel. He, he's a busy guy, but we, hopefully we can get him on the podcast he's, at some he's point. A real um, good dude. Yeah, so, um, well, another thing I want to ask, Mooch, as, as we're starting to to wind down, um, you know, you, people can, can, again, check out the book and find out more about, like, so what, what happens politically within the Mongols that the, Mooch ends up getting uh, pushed out. But you, you said something really interesting, and you could tell the frustration on your part because you love being um, a part of the Mongols. You, you love the subculture. But you say in there, I think your, your term, the way you framed it was, I, I didn't join a biker club to become a fucking politician. And and as you assumed leadership positions, you felt like you were starting to become more of a politician and less and less an outlaw biker. And so you could tell that you were starting to get frustrated. And eventually it it, it goes it goes bad in the sense of um you know the, the that you were out basically um from 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 club politics and then had to leave altogether. So if you want to just comment on that, I mean, you don't have to get to the details. People can can read the text, but that overall kind of like you you didn't want to be a politician anymore. Yeah, when I joined the club, um, a guy that I respected, still do to this day, but very old school Mongol, and I kind of asked him like, you know, I I think people don't understand how how many people leave motorcycle clubs so often. I mean, how many people join and quit? Um, and so I you know I kind of asked him about. What's the trick? How do people stay? What's the longevity? And he said, stay out of the politics, stay out of politics. And for years I did, right? Like I, I'm in Oregon. So if, why would LA politics affect me as long as my chapter is being supported and we're getting along? But the caveat to that too is, you know, you start getting a higher position in the club. You're a lot more invested in the club. So now I'm starting chapters in different states. So I'm interested in making sure they're doing okay. Or I start, you know, the Raiders support club that I had started, you know, I had all these things I was invested in. And so then I almost, you know, if you saw something that you didn't agree with, you'd want to speak up on it or, or pr protect them or, or whatever. And then you're almost roped it. I mean, that, that, that point you're stuck in the politics of it. So it's kind of this weird push pull where you don't want to get involved in politics, but if you really love your club that much, you can't have, who's going to sit silent when something's happening you don't agree with. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, um, you know, people can, um, can find out more about the details, but you, it seems like right now you're, good with where you're at in life like you know you also had some health issues that people can read about and and you've really um turned things around and and would you say that um not necessarily that that it, you're happy it went down the way it did but but you're you're happy where you're at with your life not being in the club anymore 100 percent, man I, you know there's some guys i miss i wish that um my status would be cleared up and the fact that i'd love to be able to talk to some of the, some of the guys that you know i was good friends with Outside of that, man, I don't regret a thing. I had a great time in that club. It was honestly 
I know it might be funny sounding to people that don't know much about that lifestyle, but I had a great time, amazing memories, traveled the country on a motorcycle with some of my best friends, but I also don't regret, don't regret it. I'm happy to have moved forward and be where I'm at today for sure. So, uh, Bernie, any last questions before we, we no, find this out? Was all, this was epic, man. I, yeah, these are the kind of episodes that I just, you know, <laughs> I always want to set these kind of episodes up and sometimes you feel like you're setting them up and then it doesn't kind of like hit the way you want it to, but Mooch always comes through. He's like, uh, yeah. you know, a great cleanup hitter that's going to come out and just <laughs> clear the bases whenever there's yeah. ducks on the pond. I agree. I, I agree. So how can more people find out about you, Mooch? I know you had a podcast for a while, but I don't think you're, you, you, you're I was just talking that about that the other day. I just haven't done it in a while. You know, it was one of those yeah. things I, was, I, I do it when I feel like it um, because it's just kind of sharing my story. And you know, the, the, the you guys know from this, that especially from the ex-biker stuff, is I'm not trying to get on there and explain a lot of club politics and stuff. So it's just me sharing my story. So sometimes I talk about my time in the band, um, you know, different things like that. And so when I have stories, stories to share, I jump on there and put something out. But, um, you know, my book's out. I'd say that's the best one. My Instagram is OG Mooch. Um, and I talk, you know, very... I talked to anyone on there that hits me up. I've never, I don't think I've ever left anybody on red. Um, so they can follow me there. And yeah, that's pretty much the big stuff I push. Great. All right. Well, thanks again, Mooch. And we, we encourage people to check out the book and uh, we, we appreciate your time. Thanks for your patience earlier. And um, I will, I will stay in touch, Mooch. Um, you know, I like to talk to you about music and, uh, and other stuff. Sure. So, so well, I'll stay in touch with you, brother. And we appreciate your time. And, uh, you know, thanks for everyone for watching and, and listening to our show. Please subscribe. And thanks to, to Scott and Benny. They've been holding it down. I, you know, I, I no longer have the time to be on here full time, but, but Scott and Benny are still putting out, you know, a lot of content. So, uh, you know, thanks. Thanks to you guys for keeping this going. And, and call, thanks I'm for calling, everyone for watching and listening. I'm calling for all of OG Nation to get in those comments and tell everybody that we want Jimmy back. As fast as he, as fast as possible. Obviously, we got to respect Jimmy's uh, academic, uh, you know, uh, career in academia. But please get in those comments and tell everyone how much you miss Jimmy. And you know, I tell everyone uh, off air, on air. You know, Jimmy just isn't my partner in this. He's like my best friend. He's my brother. I, I, I miss doing these kind of episodes with him. Getting to yep. come back with him and Mooch together, it's like the dream come true. <laughs> so get in those comments and tell everyone how much you uh you know love seeing Jimmy back and hopefully one day soon he'll be uh joining us back on a more consistent basis. Well thanks, Bernie. Thanks, Mooch. I'll stay in touch. We'll see you guys. OG podcast. We're out. Out. See you.